Okay, gentlemen, uh, let's talk about circumcision today. Uh, first, I'm going to admit straight off the bat that I am not a trained medical professional. I've read some studies on circumcision, certainly not all of them, uh, but I do intend to use just some general deductive reasoning here to support my belief that circumcision of infants is a barbaric practice that should be done away with. Let's assume that it can be definitively shown that circumcision has benefits for male health. You know, I'm skeptical that it does. I don't believe that it does. But I'm going to, for the purposes of this argument, proceed under the assumption that some health benefits are conferred by circumcision. Uh, let's assume that there's some hygienic benefit, a decrease in the accumulation of smegma, or a decrease in the transmission of uh, STDs. Let's assume that's the case. And if we do assume that, I want to ask you, so what? So what if that's the case? As to the hygienic benefit, is it outside the realm of possibility that surgically excising a part of a woman's labia could theoretically result in a more hygienic vagina or a decreased rate of STD infection amongst women? The human vagina is packed. I mean packed with bacteria. It menstruates once a month. It is prone to yeast infections. Right? If some sort of surgery had a tenuous link to a decrease in yeast infections, would we then take to mutilating the genitals of newborn infant girls? No, we would not. You know, it's very possible that if we did that, there would be riots in the street. And yet, we have a problem with a supposed increased amount of smegma generated by an uncircumcised penis. This can be easily corrected by routine cleaning of the foreskin. It certainly does not necessitate early infant elective surgery, or, or at least elective from the parent's perspective, because, of course, uh, this isn't elective at all for the infants that certainly can't consent to it. And with regards to consent... Uh, when we circumcise young boys or infant boys, what are we doing to them? We are surgically mutilating their genitals, and we are assuming that one day, you know, perhaps 14 or 15 years into the future, they will be appreciative of the fact that their parents did so when the boy starts taking an interest in women sexually. That's why we really do it. It's for female aesthetic preference. You know, the, the men in Europe who are largely uncircumcised aren't suffering from some giant epidemic of penis you know, disease or STDs or whatever. So clearly it's not the actual circumcision that uh, prevents STDs or whatever. Uh, try condom use. How about that? So again, we do this for aesthetic preference, and we hope that they will be appreciative of the fact that their parents did this to them when the boy starts taking an interest in women sexually. We assume that because women tend to have an aesthetic preference for a circumcised penis, as, you know, as well as some men, as, as the recent Breitbart article uh, from uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation of his name, uh, where he himself justified circumcision based at least in part on his aesthetic preference, right? So we assume that boys will consent to it because in the future, 15, 20 years down the, down the road, uh, both, I guess, uh, you know, most women and I don't know what percentage of gay men uh, prefer this. Right? And we do this automatically, and we just assume that they'll be okay with this because they're boys. And boys don't really care what's done to them as long as it's done in the name of getting themselves laid, essentially. That's, that's the attitude that we have and that we hold. So we apply the assumption of consent to little baby boys and assume that they, when they get old enough for sex, will automatically be fine with the fact that the cold steel of medical instrumentation was used to excise a portion of their penis. Now, interestingly enough, if we try to understand the age of consent or the concept of consent in regards to the double standard that occurs within gender, a pattern starts to emerge. Take, for instance, a 16-year-old girl, right? If a 16-year-old girl is attracted to a 30-year-old man, and the man is also sexually attracted to her, and that man sleeps with her, or, or should I say they consensually sleep with each other, then, our society and our legal system retroactively withdraws the consent of the 16-year-old girl, claiming at that point that she has been statutorily raped. Meaning that a 16-year-old girl's ability to consent must be protected and even revoked if a man is gaining pleasure from it. But a tiny newborn infant boy's consent must be assumed, believing it to be a foregone conclusion a decade and a half into his future if his cut penis conforms with the aesthetic preference of women. And then, when the reverse happens, you know, a 30-year-old woman sleeping with a 16-year-old boy, despite the fact that our society is getting somewhat better in this regard, I just saw an article where a woman who did that ended up getting 22 years in prison, 
Um, you know, it, it, when we see the reverse, it's still, even though we're improving slightly, tends to be much more likely to assume the validity and uphold the consent of the boy, even if he was 16, if it's pleasing a woman. The same exact argument regarding circumcision can be made about STD infection. You know, it would literally have to be the mother of all STDs in order for our society to justify slicing into the vaginas of infant girls to partially prevent it. We would never see this happen, ever. What we're really dealing with here is the fact that we circumcise boys mainly because women find the foreskin repulsive. And it is done for the aesthetic preferences of women. You know, I've heard mothers say, uh, the, the Jersey Shore degenerate Snooky, uh, for example, that they circumcise their boys because they don't want them to be rejected by females when he gets old enough to start having sex. And that is a bit of a subconscious admission of the female disgust with the male foreskin. Uh, she wishes her genetics, in the form of her son, to have a higher chance of reproducing. Thus, she wishes to remove that portion of his penis that she knows his future girlfriends will be repulsed by. Because she is repulsed by it. The ironic thing, of course, is that you'll never ever see these same women wishing to excise any part of their infant girl's vagina to please the future men their infant daughters will sleep with. Now, I love the female form. I, I love her curves. I love her hips, her lips, and her legs. I love all of that. It's great. I love everything about the way women look. Uh, well, I suppose I could say almost everything. Uh, you know, I happen to think that the female vagina is not particularly aesthetically pleasing. Everything else about the female body is, in my opinion, truly exquisite to look at. I love it. But evolution has unfortunately placed a reproductive orifice on you, uh, women, that, that very much looks like a hirsute oyster shell. Right? Even after a proper shave, it just doesn't look that appealing. Now, in terms of the sensation one experiences upon penetrating it, well, that's great. No complaints there. But women, no offense... The vagina isn't exactly the most aesthetically pleasing act of evolutionary engineering. And yet, I would never wish to mutilate it, especially infant girls, to appease my aesthetic preference. Imagine a world where we just surgically modified the infant vagina at birth to make it more pleasing to look at. It's the equivalent of surgically modifying female breasts in infancy so that they grow in a more perky fashion once they reach puberty in order to please the men that they'll eventually be with. You know, women insist on, you know, not being, quote, fat shamed and, you know, they, they insist on forming these movements around positive body images and all that fucking crap. And, and they love talking about not having to adhere to society's expectations of what female beauty is. And, and that's fine. That's fine. Whatever. I'm glad that you feel that way. Right. If that's the way you choose to live your life, it's fine with me. But the choice, however, is up to women as to whether or not they wish to overeat or whether or not they wish to exercise. When a woman is overweight, we don't march her into surgery for compulsory liposuction. When these idiotic feminist women grow their armpit hair as a part of their, quote, activism, we don't force them to shave it. They are allowed to exist as they are. Overweight, her suit, and unattractive, and rightly so. They should be allowed to exist that way if they so choose. But even still, the act of forcing someone to shave their hair or lose weight is a reversible one. These women, even if they were hypothetically forced to do these things, and no, I don't advocate any of that, would at least be able to reverse the process. We don't even give our infant boys that. We cut away a piece of their flesh, packed with nerves, that will never grow back. Now imagine, if you will, that it was determined that snipping away some part of the female sexual anatomy would trigger a hormonal mechanism that made the process of menstruation less bloody. Would we do this to infant girls, right? Surely men don't like periods. It's not aesthetically pleasing to the vast majority of men to see period blood, but we would never do this. And for the religious amongst us, at least of the Abrahamic variety or any other religion that practices ritual circumcision, if your religion told you that God demanded that your infant daughter's vagina be mutilated, would you do it then? Well, of course you wouldn't. You know, I want to share with you an, an interesting article, one of my best, I, I really like this article, and it was written by uh, one of my best contributors, that is Max Hydrogen, uh, on my website, Shedding of the Ego, and if you haven't checked it out, it's going to be in the description box, there's new content uh, almost every day, uh, sometimes two articles a day, so check my, check my website out, uh, I'd very much appreciate it if you gave it a look. 
but I cannot take credit for the rest of this video. Uh, this is all Max Hydrogens, but I do want to share with you this article he wrote titled, quote, Belitas, Why Men Are Modifying Their Members for Women. The article reads as follows, says, quote, Orgasm-inducing skills are a method by which men boast of their virility and enhance their status amongst each other. Carnal knowledge and the ability to please a woman confer bragging rights upon the practitioner. Just like pornography, female pleasure is at the heart of male sexuality. How far are some men willing to go? Bolitas are small plastic balls shot out of toy guns. However, some use them for a particular genital modification known as purling. This process involves inserting small, usually spherical objects under the skin of the penis. This custom has been practiced for at least a hundred years. It is even found in the present-day American carceral system. Let us examine the case of the Philippines. Proling has been documented in the Philippines as far back as the 16th century. And then Max quotes the Italian explorer Antonio Pigafetta, who said, quote, Both young and old males pierce their penises with a gold or tin rod the size of a goose quill. In both ends of the same bolt, some have what resembles a spur, with points upon the ends. Others are like the head of a cart nail. I very often asked many, both young and old, to see their penis, because I could not credit it. In the middle of the bolt is a hole through which they urinate. The bolt and the spurs always hold firm. They say that women wish it so, and if they did otherwise, they would not have communication with them. When a man wishes to have intercourse with a woman, she takes his penis, not in the normal way, but gently introduces first the top spur and then the bottom one into her vagina. Once inside, the penis becomes erect and cannot be withdrawn until it is limp, end quote. And then uh, Max gives another quote from the historian William Henry Scott, and he says, quote, These ornaments required manipulation by the woman herself to insert. They could not be withdrawn until the male organ was completely relaxed. There are as many as 30 different kinds of to cater to a lady's choice, end quote. And then Max continues and says, What catches my attention right away is how the penis cannot be withdrawn until flaccid. Perhaps this is the true reason why women prefer the modification, as it almost guarantees an intravaginal ejaculation, increasing the chance of pregnancy. If it is the case, let us take a moment to contemplate the extreme control these women would wield over male sexuality. Not only must men undergo a painful mutilation, not unlike tagging the ear of livestock, but are basically prohibited from non-reproductive sexual activity. We wonder how feminists can complain with a straight face about patriarchal control of female sexuality, even in North America. And then uh, Max gives an excellent video. I don't know if I'm going to include it in the description box. Like, I wanted to upload it uh, to my channel and speed up the voice and have the visual aspect in black and white in order to avoid copyright infringement but i don't want to take that chance so uh, maybe i'll upload it to my alternate channel or uh, maybe i'll just give you the timestamp along with that but that's going to be in the description box a link to that uh, if you want to just uh, watch the video the timestamp is about 38 minutes in um, but you can uh, get all the details on my on the article on my website right and then max continues uh and says the subject was even raised on a website dedicated to answering questions about the Philippines. The question says, quote, why did these men do it? According to the implant providers interviewed, the predisposing factor to implant adoption was the insertee's altruistic desire to make their partners, quote, happy and, quote, content. Other reasons given were peer pressure and male adventurousness. Still, another reason given was, and this is just a conjecture on their part, I think, that these men were probably feeling inadequate and wanted to increase their organ size. Following the insertion procedure, over 40% of the insertee respondents had penile-centered complications, ranging from biting, deep and throbbing pain, to inflammation, to pus. Some veins were apparently also punctured during the procedure, causing more than just mild itching, I'm sure. But now comes the crux of your question. What about the women? Of the 14 female responders who had Bolitas users as partners, eight confirmed that there was a, quote, difference during the act, four said there was, quote, no difference, and two were, quote, uncommitted. However, seven of the 14, and even 50%, also had rashes, wounds, pus, or inflammation in their vagina, 
after the act. And then Max finishes by saying, women complain of high heels and makeup and watching what they eat, etc. in order to be aesthetically pleasing to men. But do they even consider what men go through to gain approval from women? The pain and risks incurred with pearling demonstrates the types of extremes men accept to provide women with as much happiness as possible and the continued expectation that manhood is defined by one's ability to withstand physical abuse. This, gentlemen, is why MGTOW is so important. Because if men aren't fucking told that it's stupid and against their interests to put in this much effort, like these fucking PUA clowns and various other factions of men, including and not including the Manosphere, if men aren't told that this is stupid to structure your life around pleasing women, then they will do some stupid ass shit. They will insert uh, plastic balls surgically into their penis in order to please women more. Men are capable of incredible feats of stupidity when it comes to trying to please women. Anyway, gentlemen, uh, more to come. Still working on the book. I know you guys are waiting patiently. It's coming. Thanks for listening, gentlemen.